Welcome back everybody to another Warhammer lore video. We'll be looking at the Winds of Magic, specifically the Wind of Ulgu. And today, we're going to be looking at the spells. In my last video, I went over the Grey Order and the Shadow Mancers there within. But now, we will truly see what the extent of their powers is. Now, these spells will not be from Total War Warhammer 2. These will be the spells out of Realms of Sorcery, the second edition splat book for second edition Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. Without much further ado, let's begin with our first spell, Bewilder. Bewilder is an interesting spell. Its casting number is 8, which is quite doable once you get up to Journeyman Wizard. It's only a half action, and the ingredient is a splash of hail for a plus one on the roll, though my personal... Improvement on that would probably be making that a flask of ale, or a mug, or, or some greater amount than just a splash. I'm not a big fan of all these ingredients that are ubiquitous when they are in the face of other ingredients which are absolutely absurd in their specificity. Well, but more on that later. I'm sure we'll see in an example pretty soon. But, uh, yeah, it's just you can get a splash of ale anywhere, but too easy. Too easy is my point. Anywho... What does Bewilder do? Well, Bewilder lets you cast it on any creature within 12 squares, 24 yards, and it forces the victim to make a willpower test. If they fail, they are bewildered, hence the name, for a number of rounds equal to your magic characteristic. So, apprentice wizards will get one round, journeyman will get two, and so on and so on forth. If you're bewildered, you gotta roll percentile dice and consult the chart. 1 to 20? You can only take a half action each turn, as you are befuddled. 21 to 40, you wander in a random direction as determined by the GM. 41 to 60, the victim attacks the nearest creature with an all-out attack, so plus 20 to its attack roll, and malices to, or sorry, lack of any bonuses to dodging or parrying. And then if the nearest person's out of reach, they charge towards them and attack. 61 to 80, thankfully does nothing. The person can't do a single thing. So if this gets cast on you, this is probably the best option. Whereas 81 to 100, the victim curls into a ball. Now, as you can see, there is no good option here. Everything does something to you. And pretty much every single one of these is going to be crippling. Uh, especially in combat. And you can see there's tons of uses outside of combat. If you're like trying to sneak into a place, you can have guards like fight each other or curl into a ball as you slip past. It's got a lot of uses, as you can see. Alright, next up we have Burning Shadows. Casting number 14. So this one's going to be pretty tricky. Apprentices can't do this. You've got about a 70, what, 8% chance to succeed somebody in the comments correct me there i don't know i can't do the math right now 14 if you're rolling 2 d10s the percentile on that i don't know what the percentage of the chance would be but it's not good a high chance of failure but it's doable and the ingredient actually is a plus two here we'll, we'll get that to that in a second though so the casting time is going to be a full action so this is not something that you can just use lightly you gotta you gotta make sure it's time to use it and uh, the ingredient is a dose of Black Lotus Poison, harvested in shadow. So again, with these weird specificities, this one's not as bad, because Black Lotus you can at least find at the apothecaries and bodegas of the Empire, and I'm sure mostly around the world too. Uh, it shouldn't be too bad, but you have to do it in shadow, and you have to harvest it in that, and it's just so weird. It's just so weird. Why not just buy Black Lotus from your guy and just specify, Hey man, I'll give you an extra five crowns if you if you do this one in shadow. And I'll know if you don't. I don't know. Anyways, this causes the shadows around you to burn like acid. And it does a damage three hit, so 1d10 plus three, on any enemies uh, within nine squares. So that's, that's a pretty good AoE. When it does that, a shadow from any light source falls at the moment uh, you cast a spell. The lack of light alone does not constitute shadow for the purposes of the spell. So you actually do have to be in a dimly lit or like in some room that's casting shadows, right? It can't be pitch black, which I like. Because it's not like you're just a darkness wizard. 
You are the shadow wizard. Kind of going back to Melisandre, fucking, I don't know, season three Game of Thrones, where she's like, oh, but you must have a light to cast a shadow. And it's like, it's kind of like that. Okay, yeah, so simply being indoors doesn't count either. The building structure is not casting a shadow inside. You have to have some light inside the building. But it says, as always, the GM is the final arbiter, once again giving the freedom to the players, as they should already know that they have. Shouldn't need to be reminded, but many of us often do. Alright, what the next one does is one of the most stupid, retarded, amazing things ever. Uh, this spell, I got into a uh, 10 minute argument with my friend on how there's no way that the spell would actually do this, what he, what he described it as, what I'm about to tell you, until he showed me and I, I had to eat my hat. He was right. This spell is fucking ridiculous. It's broken. It's amazing. It's hilarious. And will lead to some of the most funny and most fun moments at your role playing table. Without further ado, I give you cloak activity for casting number 12. Quite doable, and it's only a half action that ca cast. This spell is ridiculous. You, you, you could even cast it level 1 as an apprentice wizard if you have the ingredient, if you roll perfectly. Um, the ingredient is a plus 2. It's a sketch of what your illusory action is. Now, what does that mean? Well, let me explain. I'm going to read the description, and I'm going to just explain how my friend explained it to me. This spell allows you to perform any act while appearing to do something completely different. You appear to be exactly where you are, but engaged in different activity. For example, you can appear to all eyes to be reading a book when you are actually punching someone in the face. If your action affects someone else, the victim is allowed an intelligence test to see through the illusion. Cloak activity lasts for 1d10 rounds. If cast successfully, cloak activity also disguises the act of casting spell. So my friend literally told me he can punch someone in the face and no one will know. And he was right. It literally says that in the description. So this spell, you can get away with anything. You could be robbing a bank and make it look like you're just eating some jam. You could be, I don't know, dude, destroying a bridge and making it look like you're playing hopscotch. You could be uh, fucking someone's wife and making it look like you're just dead on the ground or some shit. I don't know. Dude, you could do fucking anything with this spell. And that's why I think Grey Wizards can go anywhere and just do crazy shit. How, how do you think they get in and, and, and infiltrate, like, Skaven holds? Or, or go deep within green skin territory and stuff? It's spells like this and the next spell that get them through it. Definitely. Like, this one is just stupid. So yeah, it lasts, I don't know if I said this, but it lasts 1d10 rounds. And it also disguises the act of casting the spell if it's cast successfully. So they can't even tell you're casting a spell when you cast it. Ah. <sighs> All right. Next one. Doppelganger. Casting number seven. Casting time though. One and a half. Like one full action and then a half action after that. So it's two. Like one and a half turns. The ingredient. It's just a lock of hair from the member of the race you're impersonating. Plus one to your roll. So I guess you can kind of already see where this one's going. You can take on the appearance of any other living humanoid creature under 10 feet, including clothing, armor, and so on, human, elf, orc, etc. For a number of minutes equal to 10 times your magic characteristics, so 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, etc. This spell does not disguise your voice, only your appearance. You may look like an orc, for instance, but if you can't speak the goblin tongue, it's best to keep your mouth shut around greenskins. Should you somehow act in a suspicious manner, viewers are allowed an intelligence test to see through the illusion. If you want to look like a specific individual, you must make a successful channeling test to perfect the disguise. Otherwise, you look like an undistinguished member of the same race. So you can see immediately this one's good for like infiltration, it's just, you know, disguise self, but with a more German imperial name. Um, very useful. I had a player just use this to impersonate a Skaven, but, uh, you know, Skaven are very vocal and talkative, and when the player did not respond in kind to their chitterings, they started suspecting something was up and started chasing him down to try to investigate what was going on. The player thought he was being attacked, so he just booked it across some bunch of traps, and eventually they ended up dying and whatnot, but enough tangents. Alright, time for the next spell. This is one that's going to be kind of near the end of the Grey Wizard's career uh pretty hard to cast it's at 21 casting number 
Casting time is going to be a half action, and the ingredients are just a shred of cloth from the robes of a white, plus three. So that's actually going to be really freaking hard to find. Very specific, which I'm kind of okay with, but... Okay, like, let's go back for a second. Doppelganger had a fine ingredient. A lock of hair from the member of the race you're impersonating? That's fine, that makes sense. Cloak activity, a sketch of your illusory activity? That's kind of fine, it's alright. But, these, they're, it... It's ridiculous. Where are you gonna find, like, I don't know. I don't know, whatever, we're moving on. What this spell does is you cause terror one for one minute and uh, six rounds because you make yourself look like a nightmarish creature of purest dread. You'd think for something with 21 spell casting number, this would have a bit more details, but it does not. It, it just does not. That's not how this is going. It's just, you just cause terror, which is good. It's great, you make people, it's better than fear. You you scare the shit out of people sometimes maybe even to death but you just feel like you get a little bit more oomph out of it right all right up next eye of the beholder no not that kind of beholder casting number six this spell is only a half action and only requires a monstrous eyeball plus one or any item of best quality depending on which casting option is chosen that's also going to be a plus one so what, what are those casting options let's take a look so this spell Let's you make any moderately sized item, encumber in 75 or less, appear to be either worthless or valuable, whichever you choose. Worthless items appear rusted, rotten, moldy, broken, dilapidated, etc, etc. And the fine items appear to be very ornate and crafted with great ingenuity. The thing to remember though, is that this spell does not actually change any of the attributes of the item. A normal sword made to appear as a worthless one cuts just as fine. A crooked arrow enchanted to look masterful doesn't fly any straighter. Furthermore, tests to appraise the item whose nature is concealed by this spell suffer a minus 20 penalty. So you can really upsell whatever kind of junk you're offloading in town with all the haggling and pawn stars mechanics of the old world armory. And finally, this effect actually lasts for a number of hours equal to your magic characteristic. Hours. So you'll be long gone, hopefully, by the time that that merchant realizes you sold him a bunch of turds instead of gold. Alrighty, up next, one of the most stereotypically gray wizard spells, we've got Illusion. Now this is going to be at casting number 24, and once again taking one and a half turns to cast one full action and a half action the ingredient helps out a lot it's a crystal prism which is gonna be a plus three what not soaked in a dead man's blood not 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 found at the bottom of some well just a normal crystal prism that you can probably buy for oh i don't know maybe like 80 crowns or something really game plus three whereas that specifically harvested in the shadows thing was only a plus two ah eh, whatever 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 all right, illusion. You create an illusion anywhere within 48 yards, 24 squares, that is a near perfect simulation of reality, complete with sight, sound, and smell. Use the large template. You can make this area look like anything. Illusion lasts for a number of rounds equal to your magic characteristic, but you can keep it going with a successful willpower test each subsequent round. You must then spend a half action each round maintaining the illusion. Furthermore, you cannot cast any other spells, or the illusion disappears immediately. Viewers may be allowed an intelligence check to test if the illusion is real, but only if they have cause to suspect that it's a fake. So if they don't have any probable cause, they can't actually break out of your illusion. The precise effects of the illusion are up to the GM to determine and should follow the guidelines of common sense. All right, all right. Up next, one of the most useful and versatile spells of the Grey Order. Shadowmancers love casting Mind Hole at only eight casting number. Very, very doable. It only takes a half action, and the ingredient is only a fingernail clipping of the person to be forgotten, plus one. What does it do? Well, you cause one person within 24 squares, 48 yards, to wholly forget that you exist. So those clippings are yours. It should have just said that, but it didn't. Uh, if the target fails an opposed willpower test with you, all knowledge and memory of your existence is wiped from his mind. He can still notice you as normal, and remember anything so perceived going forward, but he just doesn't have any memories of you. This is another one where I'm gonna take up issue with the ingredients, because you can tell there's like some dichot, like, 
There's like a, uh, a difference in thought. Like maybe it got changed somewhere along the way. I guess maybe it was intended that you could make anybody forget anybody. And then they were like, maybe that's silly. Or the other way around. It was maybe originally it was intended to just make you them forget you. And then they added anybody to be forgotten. Either way, that discrepancy is kind of weird. There it says the person and then it says you in the description. But I would probably do something like the sketch of your, like a portrait or something. Something that takes a little bit more time than clipping your fingernails, which any player that gets their hands on some shears can do. Or, if, you know, I mean, their teeth. Let's be real here. But I don't, I'm not a big fan of ingredients that can just be gotten, you know, like, at any time. Like, this guy, look, what am I supposed to do? Role play them? being so desperate and crack addicted to casting mind hole that this this wizard is oh i'm sorry you've ran out of fingernails you, you could try but you you could bloody your hands for one damage if, if you try to bite the cuticles the raw ugh, ugh. no i'm not gonna do that nobody's gonna do that sensibly so i don't know what the role play there is intended to be when they just keep cutting their nails now there is some interaction i'll say this in, in the spell's defense in my current group, I have a priest of Manan, and they have holy scriptures that they need to follow, usually while on boats. And these can be anything from like, you must douse yourself in alcohol before setting sail, or even, you must never consume alcohol or be around it before setting sail. All sorts of contradictory stuff, and if you suffer the divine equivalent of Sneech's wrath, Sneech's curse, the divine God's wrath, if you suffer that, the scriptures change. So one of those is, is no no fingernail cutting or hair trimming while on boat. And that actually came up between my Shadow Mancer and my priest. They had a little dispute and their Shadow Mancer had to relent. Not wanting to create any waves. Pun not intended. With the priest of Manan. Enough of a rant. Let's move on to the next spell. Mockery of Death. At casting number 18, this spell is going to be a full action. The ingredient is a corpse shroud buried for at least a year. Again, what the fuck? Where are they going to just find these things? Make it something doable. With this one, I would say like the veil from a widow who's just mourned within the past week. Or something at least doable. There's tons of people dying all the time. How are you going to just dig up? Are you going to dig it up? Like, what the hell are you actually going to do? You're going to go grave digging? And the Shadow Mancer, he's going to go grave digging and piss off the Priest of Moor? Like, who did this? Which, which Shadow Mancer actually used the Corpse Shroud buried for at least a year? And he was like, it has to... Did he, te did he test? Did he have ones at like 11 months? 11 months and, and 20 days? Didn't work? Has to be at least a year? <laughs> these spells these spell ingredients they just mm. anyway yeah i would just say like some widow's veil instead of this plus two boom have it mockery of death you cause someone to appear and behave as if dead to all sight and inspection this is the romeo and juliet spell that person continues to sense his environments through hearing smell and if his eyes are open sight but he cannot move his body in any way whatsoever until the spell ends However, he continues to require air and other essentials of life. This state persists until you will its end, or until a number of days equal to a number of days pass equal to your magic characteristic. An unwilling target can resist the spell with a successful willpower test. You can also cast the spell on yourself. It is a touch spell. So this one, you know, you could you could use this for a lot of infiltration purposes. I could obviously see, you know, sneaking in your party members pretending they're dead corpses and you use, you conjure that with a uh, doppelganger and you make it look like you're just some soldier or cultist or whatever, just disposing of another body. That one I, I definitely could see being very useful. It's nasty at casting number 18 though, that's, that's going to be hard to do. Up next we've got Mutable Visage at casting number 7. The casting time is only going to be a half action, and the ingredient is a pinch of good craftsmanship cosmetics. Uh, I think it should be a little bit more than that. Maybe the whole thing. I know that's probably like 30 crowns, but it's only a plus one bonus. And I feel like the ingredients should really be like, a, all right, like, I invested in this to ensure this spell would work, you know? It shouldn't just be something where it's like, oh yeah, I just take another splash of ale out of my my flask that's 2.5 liters sitting at my 
my waist, I've got another 250 splashes. So, GM, can we just count it as me having the ingredient forever from now on? It's bad roleplay. It's not, it's not interesting. It's just, like, it's there for fluff. And it's only there to, like, either be taken away or made harder to get or what else is it really doing there, you know? It's just giving, like, it's a free plus one. I feel like any bonuses should be have to be, like, invested into or earned, you know? And besides, honestly, if you're running a party with wizards, they're going to be making more than enough money to obtain the ingredients for the spells that they want to cast. So, yeah. Alright, up next. Alright, so what this does. You make your target subtly more or less attractive, but in a way that has a noticeable effect on the way people regard them in social situations. So it's either a plus 10 or minus 10 to fellowship for a number of hours equal to the magic characteristic of the caster. An unwilling target may make an opposed willpower test to avoid the spell's effects. And you can also cast it on yourself. It is also a touch spell. Alright, up next we've got Pall of Darkness, casting number 15. Casting time, half action. The ingredients are the eyes of a new plus 2. You create a swirling area of impenetrable darkness anywhere within 48 yards 24 squares of you of you that lasts for a number of rounds equal to your magic characteristic use the large template those affected cannot see even with night vision the confounding effect of pall of darkness means that those affected can only take a half action each round unless they make a successful willpower test at the start of their turn so this one's pretty crazy uh if you're fighting humans this is going to be insane if you're fighting even other creatures, this is still going to be insane. So as you can see, this spell is really insane for getaways or for even just maybe ambushing a target, um, trapping them, luring them, all sorts of things. Hiding, you can't see through it. You can just make it look like really dark shadows in an alleyway. Who's going to investigate that? So yeah, you could do a lot with that spell. All right, up next, Shadow Cloak. Casting number five. Casting time, half action, ingredient, a piece of charcoal. This one, sure, that's fine. You wrap yourself in shadow so you are difficult to detect. Shadow Cloak gives you a plus 20 on concealment tests for number of minutes equal to your magic characteristic. So that's a self-casting spell, pretty useful for hiding. Uh, I think eventually you get invisibility. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure you do. But that's still useful in the meantime, casting number 5, that's insane. And you could even use that as a bounce off point with the spell creation rules to make one that casts on a group of party members. Probably put it at like, casting number 14 or something, you know? Or help do an overcast if you get 5, every 5 overs, an extra person you can cast it on. So 10 would be 2 people, 15 would be 3 people. Anyway, up next we've got Shadow Knives at 22. Uh, casting number. Casting time is a half action, and the ingredient is a knife of cold forged iron, plus three. As it sounds like it would do, you conjure up a number of shadow knives equal to your magic characteristics, and you hurl them like Dio at one or more opponents within 48 yards or squares. Shadow knives are magic missiles with damage three, so 1d10 plus three. Their shadowy nature also means that all non-magic armor is ignored when reducing damage, so you just slice through tin cans like nobody's business if you get the spell off. Up next we've got Shadow of Death, uh, casting number 15, full action. Shred cloth from the robes of a white, so it looks like you really want to be hunting whites, I guess, as a, uh, as a shadow mancer. You use the power of illusion to make yourself look fearsome and deadly. You caused fear for one minute. You can see how I just read that just now and all the, all the excitement drained out of me. That is pretty dumb. Six less of a casting number for fear instead of terror and you still need the same ingredient. I Don't know. I don't know dude. I don't know fantasy flight. You could have tried a little harder on that one I love you. I respect you. You've made one of the best things ever in terms of role-playing systems, but the ingredients a Little lacking here up next my players favorite spells shadow steed casting number 11 Full-time action. The ingredient says it's a chip of a hoof from a well-traveled horse. Spe specific enough. It's pretty good, you know. You could get that like, Hey, I'll, uh, I'll shoe your horse or whatever. Get the muck out of its hooves. Yeah, pay me a pence and to like some traveler. Sneaky, sneaky. Get your ingredient. They get their ho horses hooved cleaned. Everybody wins. This one lets you summon a shadow horse. Uh, carries you a minimum amount of gear. No more. Like once you start taking a cumbrance, it can't, it can't carry you. 
Uh, it does this noiselessly and at great speed until you stop riding until the next day's first light dawns. The horse has statistics of a normal riding horse, but also has concealment plus 30 and the navigation spell skill. So I'm going to take a step back from the description real quick. My players, I started them off in this campaign. They're all wizards or spellcasters or magical to some degree. We've got a werebear in there. And, uh, yeah. So I started them off on a boat about to be sacrificed by Slaneshi cultists. They started with absolutely nothing, completely naked. Uh, this is like a hard mode kind of thing. They're, but they're all wizards, so, you know, that that's like the counterbalance to it. And, uh, they were stuck out at sea in the Sea of Claws, middle of the night, uh, late autumn. It's it's getting cold. Winter's coming. Completely, like, just wearing the bloody robes of the, the cultists that they slew. Mast is broken. They only have a couple of oars. None of them are in any condition to row. They summon a shadow steed and a water steed. The priest of Manan had a water steed because the... Manon School doesn't have a lot of cool spells, and I'm willing to work with my players in making new spells for them, and he kind of just wanted a revamp of, of Shadow Steed. So those two ghostly horses managed to pull the boat back to shore, but here's the funny part. Nobody actually had navigation as a skill. So what they did was they used the, the Shadow Steed's navigation skill to navigate them back home. So just kind of a funny little anecdote. Anyway, furthermore, the Shadow Steed t travels at top speed without fatigue, bearing you half again faster than a normal riding horse would be able to. When the duration expires, the horse vanishes around a corner into a shadow or in a similar manner. So in the campaign, it just went below the waves. You can also designate an under another individual that the steed will bear instead of you, so you can, you can let other people ride on it. I got this cool little picture of it. Almost done, almost done, all right. Coming up next, we've got Shroud of Invisibility. This is the one that you've probably been waiting for. Casting number 17. Casting time, full action. The ingredients, a gossamer shroud. So it should be fairly easy to get. So what you do is you shroud yourself with magic and disappear from sight for 1d10 rounds. While you are invisible, you can't be targeted with ranged attacks, including magic missiles. Any melee attacks you make receive a plus 20 weapon skill bonus, and anyone within 4 yards can make a hard minus 20 perception test to detect you using non-visual senses. If they are successful, they can attack you, but with a minus 30 to their weapon skill or ballistic skill. But you cannot cast this on others. At 17, that's... that's some shit. Alright, up next we've got Substance of Shadow, number 22, casting number 22. Full action. A perfectly round piece of finest velvet cloth. Plus three. That's the ingredient. Mm, decently hard to find, I guess. Substance of shadow. Select a single character or an object with an encumbrance of no greater than 200 that lies entirely within a shadow. The subject of substance of shadow becomes invisible and silent. The subject also becomes partially insubstantial. This means that others cannot affect the target physically. They cannot attack a character affected by the spell, cannot shove or pick up or even stumble over anything affected by the spell, and so on. The target, however, can affect anything he or it normally could. An affected character could move around and launch attacks. An affected piece of rope could suspend some object. An affected wizard could cast spells and so forth. The effects of this spell continue indefinitely as long as the target remains entirely in shadow. But effects end as soon as the shadow or concealing the target is interrupted, even for a, an instant. Lack of light alone does not constitute shadow for purposes of this spell. Targets must be in a distinct shadow cast by some object interrupting light shining from some source. Simply being indoors does not count. As always, the GM's is the final arbiter. You may cast a spell on yourself. This is a touch spell. This is their oh shit big dick moment spell. This turns them basically into the ghost bros that Belagar Ironhammer has in Total War Warhammer. Except even stronger, you actually cannot be attacked by anything. And nobody can see you. Nobody can hear you. Nobody can detect you. You are a killing shadow. But even beyond that, you're just like an invisible killing ghost. Uh, this spell is ridiculous, and I would probably put the casting number a little higher. Honestly. Um, Alright, up next, we've got Take No Heed. Casting number 9. 
Casting time, half action. Ingredient, a pinch of nothing in particular. Now this one I would normally take problem with, but let's just read this and you'll see why it kind of makes sense. It's kind of cheeky, kind of funny, kind of kind of humorous. All right, take no heed. You become very easy to ignore. Although people can see you perfectly fine, they tend to not notice you and don't recall anything about you after you've left. People must make an opposed willpower test with you in order to approach or talk to you unless you speak first, even if they've noticed you earlier. They need not re-roll in the middle of conversation, but if, for example, a shopkeeper succeeded in a roll to notice you when you came in to his shop but was busy with other things at that moment, he'd need to make another roll to come over to talk to you later in your visit. Even those who notice and approach or speak to you must make another unopposed willpower test to remember any specific details about you after you've left. The nature of the spell is such that the effects do not disturb or alarm those trying to notice or remember you. They chalk the situation up to distractions or the like. Last one minute per point of your magic characteristic. So this is good for like a quick in and out, gotta go to the shopkeep, like take some shit, maybe steal some shit, sneak in. This is very much a stealthy infiltrating spell. And the ingredient, it's kind of like, you were never there at all. There was never anything at all. It was just nothing. So what do you need to cast a spell? A pinch of nothing. I, I Again, I think it's pretty clever and kind of funny. It It's nice, you know? I laughed. You didn't hear me do it. All right, up next, we've got Throttling. Casting number 13, casting time, full action. The ingredient is a garrote that has been used to strangle a man. So this is one that's pretty handy, because that's a plus two. You can strangle a dude with this, then cast garrote, or sorry, cast throttling on some random dude. Description, you send ropes of inky darkness to throttle anyone within 12 yards, six squares, cutting off their ability to breathe entirely, forcing them to make a toughness test every turn. You can maintain this spell with a half action on each subsequent round, but you may cast no further spells while doing so. If you maintain the spell, the toughness test is a modified accumulative minus 10 penalty each round until it has failed, at which point the target begins to take damage. The first round of failure causes a damage one hit that ignores armor, and each subsequent round, the damage of the hit increases by one. No t additional toughness tests are allowed to resist damage after the first test has been failed. The damage simply continues to compound until you stop or are forced to stop concentrating on the spell. So, this spell is absolutely insane if you can get it off. It, so, first round, they take a minus 10 toughness test. So let's say they have 44 toughness. They gotta get 34 or below to succeed and, and not take damage just for that one round. Next round, minus 20. They now need to get a 24 or lower. Third round, now it needs to be a 34 or lower. Fourth round, it now needs to be a 4 or lower. If you have a valuable target that you need to interrogate or incapacitate, this is the spell for you. If your party is ganging up on somebody, one lone target, and they're a bit of a bastard who can one-shot you guys, this is the spell for you. Once they fail, it's not just one damage they take. My Shadow Mancer player actually thought that that was the case. And I had to ask him to verify to make sure he was doing as much damage as he should be doing. Damage 1 means 1d10 plus 1. The damage increasing every turn, including, I mean, God, ignoring armor, that's insane. Then it's 1d10 plus 2, 1d10 plus 3, 1d10 plus 4, 1d10 plus 5, until they fucking die or you decide to stop hurting them. This is an amazing spell. Uh... But you do need to get a little close. But yeah, with a casting number like 13, damn, dude, that is that is a good spell. All right. Finally, we come down to our last spell, Universal Confusion. Casting number 27. Casting time is going to be a half action. This is the strongest spell in the Shadow Mancer's repertoire. And thusly, it requires the eyes of a Chimera. Chimera. Plus three. So this is just a more powerful version of Bewilder that can affect many targets. It says here use the large template, but honestly, for casting number 27, I urge all GMs to make this, like, way more powerful. Because they kind of get gypped here. I would say, you know, anybody maybe even within sight radius or something as insane as that, you know? Like, if you can see their face. They have to take the test. Um, 
and I would make it last longer than regular Bewilder. They're, they have to get a, a 27 or higher. You're asking a lot out of players. They're risking Sneech's Curse by a lot when they're rolling three dice. Um, and let's see, what does Bewilder last for anyhow? It's just rounds equal to your magic characteristic. It should be minutes or something. If you're if you're if you're popping off twenty seven, well, you'll see this as we go into the other spells of other lores. But if you're popping off with a casting number twenty seven spell, you deserve to kind of win that fight. I mean, all the other spells that are at that level. Mages all around the world can feel it. Like, within five miles of the spell being cast, can feel it. For example, for Hish, they have a giant, like, satellite kill laser from orbit that comes down as their spell. And that is frowned upon by the Elders. If you're using it in anything other than demonic combat. But everybody within five miles can, can feel that disturbance. Every single wizard. Ah, uh, can feel that disturbance within five miles. And yet, for the Shadow Mancers, they're kind of gypped on this. So I would urge any GM to make your own changes, whether you want to use the changes I proposed or what, to make this spell a little bit better. Yeah. Alright, so those are all the spells of the Grey Wind that the Shadow Mancers of the Grey Order have access to. These spells are split up in the realms of sorcery between three lists. So the spells, the Shadow Mancers come in three different flavors on average. Obviously you can substitute a couple spells out. Most GMs will let you do that. I let you do that. And I also let you come up with your own. But we've got Shadow Elemental, which has Bewilder, Cloak Activity, Doppelganger, Dread Aspect, Illusion, Pall of Darkness, Shadow Cloak, Shadow Knives, Shroud of Invisibility, and Universal Confusion. So this one is more like the primal controlling the shadows aspect of the lore of shadows, hence the elemental name. Next we have Shadow Mystical, that's going to be Burning Shadows, Eye of the Beholder, Mind Hole, Mockery of Death, Mutable Visage, Shadow of Death, Shadow Steed, Substance of Shadow, Take No Heed, and Throttling. So this is kind of the middle of the road between having some damage and some stealth. And this one is more kind of just for, like, trickery and getting away. Though this is also the only one with the crazy substance of shadow spell. So this one, I really would say, is more the kind of, like, one for killing people. Finally, we have the one my Shadow Mancer player got, Shadow Cardinal. This one has Cloak Activity, Doppelganger, Eye of the Beholder, Illusion, Mind Hole, Mockery of Death, Shadow Knives, Shadow Steed, Shroud of Invisibility, and Throttling. As you can see, this one is definitely much more for the whole sneaking around sort of thing. And any Shadow Mancer who takes this one will be very adept at infiltrating, to be sure. Though, every single list kind of has... I, I, I would probably say, of, of all the different lores with the, their lore list, the three lores lists of the lore of Shadows are probably the least different from each other out of all the different lores. Finally, I guess we'll just go into some rituals. Now, there aren't really many rituals for the lore shadows written out, but uh, I did have a player once make a, a ritual for the lore of shadows, so I thought I would share it with you. Obviously, arcane, arcane language, magic, magic two. Uh, I believe his casting number on this one was 17. And the ingredients, I can't remember what it was. I want to say it was something like the cloak from a body lo uh, like lost to the woods and like never found by people or something like that. Anywho, um, our party had found a cove along the cliff sides while they were sailing on their broken boat. And they decided to take up residence inside of it to avoid the glares of the witch hunters and to avoid dealing with a particularly powerful wizard that was in town. They didn't want to be found without having, you know, a little bit more authority in, in proving that they were actually licensed magisters. Anywho, uh, the Shadow Mancer created a spell that would basically make it look like the entrance to the cove was just a solid rock face like cliff face. 
that there was no opening in it or anything that and anybody sailing by would just see another part of the cliff. So he was able to kind of warp the illusion spell, power that up, and I think it was he was going to lose his arm if he had failed. Some some big penalty, I can't quite remember. But yeah, as you can see, there are plenty of different things that you can do with the lore of shadow. Mostly for sneaking, mostly for evading. But there are other things you can do. You can do lots of damage, you can kill people with it. Just a really good tool set overall for the kind of more roguish spellcaster out there. Alright everybody, that sums it up for the Grey Wind. Next time, I think we're going to be going over the Green Wind. And I'll see you then. In the meantime, I think the next video that's going to come out is going to be a Dominions 5 video. But who am I kidding? Nobody actually made it to the end of this video. Though if you did, you are contractually obligated to like, comment, and subscribe. I'm just fucking around. Have a wonderful night. Don't kill yourself. Have a wonderful day. Don't kill yourself. And just take it easy and keep being cool people, alright? Jeez.